Thanks again for, for inviting me. Uh, let me also add that, uh, uh, although I do, I, I wish it was possible to have an actual in-person visit. Um, although, you know, it, 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 it may be convenient to have, to, have uh, to do these seminars from the comforts of home, especially early in the morning, but uh, it really doesn't compare to face-to-face to, to, to -face, uh, meetings. Um, all right, so today, or uh, I guess your afternoon, uh, I want to talk about a few things, but I will focus on uh, some recent set of observations um, that we made sort of unexpectedly uh, within uh, macaque visual cortex. Um, specifically, I'll focus on some sort of surprising evidence, really surprising to us, uh, that uh, evidence that abstract or task rules are encoded by distinct populations within uh, neuro uh, by neurons within uh, visual cortex. Um, oops, okay, yeah, but, but first, I first um, before talking about abstract rules, I want to start by with what I th uh, believe is some some important background um, information that I think will set the context for the, the experiments we'll talk about. Um, and which is that uh, in humans and other primates, visual perception and visual, visually guided behavior really begins with the uh, active extraction of visual information from the environment largely by way of eye movements. Um, vision in primates involves a constant shifting of gaze from one point of interest to the other. And this is of course because of the, that, the fact that high visual acuity exists only in a tiny portion of the, the retina and the phobias, of course, and, the, and thus the direction of gaze has to shift uh, constantly in order to gather up all the fine details um, in the visual environment. So this sort of classic figure from Alfred Jarvis, we have a, a portrait of a young woman on the left and, the, and then the same portrait on the right. And superimposed on that image uh, are the scan, is the sort of scan path of, of a single subject who viewed that image. Of course, you see the, 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 the points of fixation on the, on the important points of interest, they're used in, the subject was asked to judge the, the, the was asked to judge the age of the, of the woman in the picture. So of course the points of fixation fall on the, the most informative points in the image, the eyes, nose, and mouth. Um, so you can see the little individual uh, points of fixation. And of course the, dot, the, dot, the, line, the dots are connected by, uh, by psychotic eye movements that bring the shift the gaze across it. Um, and, and you know that these movements are sort of exquisitely guided by the features of the image. And so visually guided eye movements uh, are really sort of the most fundamental sensory motor functions that we and other primates um, perform. And this behavior really exemplifies uh, the nervous system's need to continually select sensory information, in this case, visual information um, to guide the next behavior. <clears throat> Uh, so I'd like to so I'll start today by sort of summarizing some of the background work that we've done over the, over the years um, in order to identify specific circuits or at least one circuit that uh, in which visual information is selected, uh, for example, during attention. Uh, in addition, though, if, I, if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about sort of this sort of an interesting time in systems and uh, circuit level neuroscience in which the arsenal of tools is sort of expanded in it, but less so in, 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 in work with, with primates, but that sort of changed recently. So I'll, I'll talk a bit about some uh, new methods of large scale physiology, um, if there's time. All right, so let's, oops. Right, um, okay, so among the things that we know about the selection of visual information during ex exploration, uh, and the control of attention is that prefrontal cortex definitely uh, seems to play a necessary role. Uh, an earlier work begun in my lab identified a role of prefrontal gaze control neurons, uh, both in the perceptual effects of uh, visual attention and the effects of attention on the representations in, in posterior visual cortex. And specifically, uh, we, we identified a role of the, the, the frontal eye field uh, in the control of visual spatial attention. The frontal eye field is shown here in the anterior bank of the arcuate sulcus. It mostly lives, that's right, this is a, a side view of the macaque's cerebral cortex. And, uh, and so yeah, the frontal eye field sits here uh, in, the, in, the, in the arcuate sulcus, most of it is buried deep. And, uh, oops, uh, and right, and so, the, the frontal eye field is the part of a prefrontal cortex that's most directly involved in the control of 
of visually guided eye movements and achieves that role primarily by way of its output to the spiriculiculus and the, the brain stem saccade generator uh, here. Um, but I keep losing the control of the, okay. But in addition, in addition uh, the frontal eye field is also heavily interconnected with uh, areas in the posterior visual cortex, uh, uh, areas beyond uh, V1. Um, and so and it gets inputs from these areas, from each of these retinotopically organized areas. But in addition, it also projects directly back to each of these areas. Um, and this latter projection uh, seems to provide the basis by which frontal eye field neurons influence visual processing uh, in relation to planned movements, whether or not those movements are actually carried out. And we know that this projection from the FEF uh, directly modulates activity within posterior visual cort uh, cortical areas. And that it's at least one major component in the control of visual spatial attention. Right, and so, uh, and indeed, work in other species, including in humans, has found homologous or at least analogous um, evidence for a role of, of, of cortical gaze fields uh, in the control of visual selection and, and visual spatial attention. This includes work in humans, as I mentioned. Um, uh, mice, you know, appear to, or mice have a sort of analogous you know, uh, gaze control area in medial prefrontal cortex that directly uh, modulates activity within visual cortex. Um, some years ago, Eric Knudsen uh, showed that in the barn owl, the, the arcopaleal gaze field is just a, a cortical uh, uh, area that controls the, the head movements, um, projects directly into the optic tectum and, and modulates incoming um, uh, visual and auditory signals. So evidence from across species uh, indicates uh, that visual spatial attention or at least visual selection is accomplished at least in part by neurons involved in, in gaze control. Um, so although you know, there is there is considerable evidence uh, by now that frontal eye field neurons in the, in, the, uh, in the primate brain directly modulate visual activity in within posterior visual cortex, the sort of the nature of this modulatory control still sort of, it sort of remains fairly unclear. And so uh, in an effort to further understand the role of FEF neurons in the control of visual signals, uh, a former postdoc of mine, Brad Induced, who's now professor at University of Utah, um, characterized the properties of FEF neurons that project directly to visual cortex, because um, we wanted to know what, it, what sort of signals are being sent back to uh, visual cortex to modulate that activity. And Brad identified, um, uh, the the projection the frontal eye field projection neurons by anadromic stimulation, which is, as many of you might know, is an extremely tedious uh, uh, process, a very, very challenging uh, uh, um, approach, but it's a <clears throat> it's a, it's very effective. Um, uh, and so, and, but but yeah, so the the the, the point here was that. Uh, neurons in the frontal field that exhibit sort of a broad range of, of functional properties. In fact, they, they sort of span the, the visual, the, the visual to the motor spectrum. There are neurons that have purely visual responses, neurons that have purely motor responses. Most neurons are sort of somewhere in between. Um, so other neurons have this memory delay activity. So in a the sort of standard way of, of, of of demonstrating those functional properties is to is to uh, train animals on a delayed response task or, or, or memory guided saccade task that temporally dissociates different uh, different components in the behavior so the animal maintains fixation. You flash a visual stimulus somewhere to, to identify the receptive field. The animal has to remember that location during a delay period, and then later on has to make a memory guided eye movement. Uh, uh, to that location. So you isolate the movement and the visual and the other components um, um, with this task. And so Berad was interested in identifying which, um, which, which types of cells, visual cells, which, which visual motor cells, et cetera, are the ones that project back to extrastriate visual cortex. Um, and I'm just gonna sort of briefly summarize the, uh, something that we found, which was that, um, one, you know, one would have predicted, and indeed many people uh, did predict that, that, um, it, that uh, or hypothesized that the dominant uh, functional class of neurons that should, should project back to visual cortex should be um, neurons with visual properties. But if you looked at the neurons that were identified anadromically as projecting back to, in this case, area V4, 
um, the proportion of cells that had visually uh, visual responsive uh, activity were, was the same as the overall frontal lifo population. So there, there wasn't they weren't dis disproportionately visual. Uh, in contrast, um, neurons with movement activity, whether or not they had visual activity, also um, were very rare. In fact, it was only I think one neuron out of the set that we identified that had um, activity during the during the movement. Uh, surprisingly, all the neurons that we identified had activity in this memory delay period. That is, the, 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 the activity of the neurons could tell you where, where the cue used to be. So this was actually quite surprising to us. Um, but uh, as I'll illustrate, it sort of, in many ways, it, it fits the um, other properties of these, these projection neurons. Um, oh, yeah, I should add that recently. So if you, so we, had, we uh, in identifying the cells that project the back, we can also identify the cells that receive input from visual cortex, neurons that are activated by stimulation of uh, visual cortex. And another sort of surprise is that the neurons that are driven most uh, reliably are neurons that have visual motor properties, not just neurons that have visual properties. And that was also a surprise. It's disproportionately visual motor neurons. Right. So. So we observed that feedback input from the frontal eye field to visual cortex is dominated by the sort of neurons with this sustained memory delay activity. Um, well, so, okay, so what else do we know about the circuit? Well, we know that these feedback projections, or and I, and I say feedback loosely, um, because the, well, these neurons uh, originate from layers two, three in the frontal eye field, which traditionally would, would suggest that they're feed forward, but I won't get into that. Uh, they, it's been shown that they, that they're, um, they're presynaptic uh, predominantly uh, to pyramidal neurons in all layers. They, their synapses tend to occur at the apical dendrites of pyramidal cells throughout layers. But uh, in addition, so I'm going to say a bit about what, what we know about this circuit. So we know that these neurons tend to be memory delay cells. They're layer two, three cells. They synapse largely on uh, pyramidal cells in the visual cortex. Um, some years ago, we showed that um, this projection is mediated uh, at least in part by dopamine D1 receptors. That is, if you manipulate dopamine D1 uh, activity with the frontal eye field, you can, that's sufficient to change the, act, the visual responsiveness of neurons back here in the visual cortex. Uh, that effect is D1 mediated, not D2. Um, and so we know that these neurons, uh, or well, we hypothesize that these neurons express the dopamine D1 receptors and recently, we showed that in fact that's true. If you if you label cells with, with, with retrograde tracers from extracellular cortex area MT or area V4, and you co-label them with uh, uh, dopamine receptors, um, sorry, you, you identify the dopamine receptor, receptor expressing neurons, you find that almost all the neurons that that project back to extracellular cortex uh, express um, dopamine D1 receptors. In contrast to only about half that express dopamine D2 receptors and also in contrast to uh, local interneurons, uh, such as um, parvalumin, calretin, and calbindin, um, uh, that, ex that express dopamine D1 receptors. So we know that this circuit involves neurons that express dopamine D1 receptors disproportionately, that they have memory delay activity, and that they synapse largely on uh, parental neurons in the visual cortex. Um, oops. All right, so, th so that's sort of where we are so far in in that particular circuit, and that, as I'll as I'll get back to it, uh, um, that sort of sets the stage for what I'm going to talk about next. Um, in that, it demonstrates that there's information about um, uh, the, the the preparation of eye movements uh, in visual cortex, and it originates from uh, it, that's sorry, it's, it's, which gets direct input from from the frontal eye field. All right, so um, abstract rules. All right, so uh, it's pretty clear that um, you know many behaviors can rely sort of simply and solely on fixed stimulus response associations. Uh, that is, the rules governing how to map sensory stimuli onto behavioral responses can be completely concrete. Uh, and an obvious example would be um, the rules of determining our response to the colors of stoplights, right? So the mapping of green and red onto behavioral responses uh, is fixed in a simple stimulus response association. However, uh, you know, more complex behaviors often rely on the ability to flexibly assign different behavioral responses to the same stimuli, depending on the context. 
Uh, so for example, in, uh, even, in these, even with these stimuli, we're able to flexibly escape the more rigid st uh, stimulus response associations under uh, special circumstances, such as when uh, we hear an approaching siren and the light is green and therefore we have to stop, um, or if we're intending to make a right turn, um, and thus we can proceed when the light is red, at least in most states in the United States. Um, that is, we're able to apply more com uh, complex abstract rules uh, to, uh, 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 to the color of stoplights. And as a result, um, we can initiate very different behavioral responses um, to the identical stimuli, and, and, and that depends on the overarching goal and the context. Right, so, um, you know, by now, there's a sort of wealth of studies in non-human primates that indicate pretty clear behavioral manifestations of abstract rules. Um, and a number of neurophysiological studies have identified neurons that encode abstract rules. So for example, um, in a in landmark study by Wallace and Miller, uh, monkeys were trained on a memory task in which they were rewarded for releasing a lever to correctly indicate the appearance of either of a matching stimulus um, or a non-matching stimulus. Um, so in this case here, or matching here and not matching here. Uh, monkeys were given cues about which rule was enforced by a different means, say for example, a high or low tone. Uh, and neurons in prefrontal cortex um, exhibited strong selectivity to which rule was currently enforced. Uh, uh, and this neuron, for example, shows selectivity to a matching rule. Uh, yeah, this is the matching rule. Um, regardless of how the, the rule was actually cued, and regardless of which sample stimulus was to be remembered, it's just that the rule was being uh, signaled. Other neurons were selected for the non-matching rule, and overall, almost half the neurons preferred either the match rule or the non-matching rule. And other studies have demonstrated strong rule uh, signals from neurons recorded in premotor cortex and also in the parietal cortex. But uh, what's much less clear is whether neurons in sensory areas convey information about abstract rules. And it's also clear as to whether they should. Uh, for example, there's virtually no evidence that neurons in macaque visual cortex encode information about abstract rules. In fact, uh, sort of a classic assertion uh, is that rule information emerges specifically outside of sensory areas. Now, um, of course, it's widely known that variation, other cognitive factors such as selective attention or working memory or reward value influences the activity of neurons throughout visual cortex. But I guess you know, crucially, this modulation is generally thought to contribute to changes in stimulus-related aspects of behavior performance, such as perceptual sensitivity uh, to attended stimuli, uh, memory of relevant lo uh, locations or stimuli, or the reinforcement of particular stimulus features, right? Uh, in these cases, uh, stimulus selection of stimulus information, sorry, the selection of stimulus information is inherent uh, in the behavioral, con uh, given behavioral context. Um, and the involvement of sensory neurons in signaling selected stimuli or stimulus dimensions, you know, it seems pretty clear. But what's less clear is whether information about the rules governing the task uh, is, uh, are also represented by sensory neurons. Now, you know, often the rule governing performance on a particular task is you know, orthogonal to any particular dimension of sensory input, and that rule may merely identify appropriate mappings between sensory input and behavioral responses. And in those cases, the activity of sensory neurons may not be expected to encode um, abstract rules. But importantly, this you know, really hasn't been tested very, um, very thoroughly. So um, for, for reasons largely having nothing to do with the encoding of rules, by visual cortical neurons, we recently found ourselves in, uh, with a unique opportunity to address that question. Um, we were interested in, inter interested in studying properties of working memory related activity in visual cortex. Uh, so we trained monkeys on two versions of a spatial working memory task. Uh, uh, specifically, monkeys were trained to uh, perform a task in which they either looked at or avoided looking at a memorized location. So um, in the look task uh, shown here, um, monkeys memorize a cue location and then after a delay, um, they uh, made an eye movement to the, the, the location that matched to the location of the cue. In the, uh, in the avoid task, monkeys were instead uh, rewarded for doing the opposite. That is they were, that after the, after the delay, the animal was rewarded for looking at the, the novel location, the uncued location. 
And, you know, importantly, although the behavioral response differed between the two tasks, looking at or avoiding the cue location, uh, neither of these tasks can be solved correctly without memorizing the cue location, right? So you have to memorize this location in both cases, it's the response mapping that's, that changes. Um, and so, and monkeys perform the two tasks in alternating blocks of trials and were cued as to which rule was, was enforced um, by the color of the, 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 the cue. Um, also, because they were blocked, the animal could also just, you know, it, it, even if they didn't, if they didn't um, he, sort of heed the color of the cue, the the reward um, uh, would also was, was a signal for which 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 uh, rule was enforced. But they generally um, uh, use the cue. Right. So as I mentioned, two, um, I'm going to show you some data from two animals trained on this task. These are this just shows the performance in the different look or avoid blocks. Uh, and um, and uh, shows that, that they could switch between the two rules of running and alternating blocks. And across sessions, um, these are different experimental session days. Um, the performance did vary. So on a given session, the performance on the avoid might be greater than the look or vice versa. But on average, um, uh, they were pretty similar. And um, the data I'm going to show you, I'm going to, I'm going to break it out by, um, by individual sessions for, for a reason, but um, rather than collapse them all together and separate it by animal. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So while the monkeys performed the two tasks, uh, we recorded from populations of single neurons distributed across layers of area before. And I think I mentioned, uh, or maybe I didn't, uh, area before is a, a retinotopically organized uh, visual area that sits somewhere roughly in the in the, the middle of a visual visual cortical processing hierarchy. And we recorded V4 neurons using 16 to 24 channel linear array electrodes. Um, and this shows an example of uh, visual receptive fields mapped with this with the linear array electrodes. So these are all receptive fields that are aligned uh, within visual space. And uh, in virtually all the recordings I'll talk about today, um, visual receptive fields were almost entirely overlapping indicating that our recording penetrations were made largely within single, single columns of, of visual cortex. Right, so, so we asked whether V4 neurons encoded information about the two tasks prior to the start of uh, each behavioral trial. And we focused on a 300 millisecond pre-Q period during each task um, when only the task rule was known and when the monkey awaited the, the uh, the appearance of the queue at one of four locations. So this is so they don't know where, where the, which locations they have to remember, but they but they um, but they know the rule that needs to be applied to the to the, to the queue. Um, now uh, it's important to, to point out that you know in other forms of visual cortical modulation, um, different behavioral conditions tend to produce largely unidirectional changes in uh, in activity across visual cortical areas. So what does that mean? So for example, firing rates generally increase uh, for all neurons when attention or working memory is directed into a receptive field or when receptive field stimuli have a higher reward expectation. Um, so the effects are usually, usually unimodal and unidirectional. Um, so we first looked just for differences in the overall firing rates among each of the simultaneously recorded uh, before neurons uh, during each of the uh, experimental sessions. So what we're looking at here uh, is this is da data from one uh, experiment from a single experiment, uh, looking at the average um, normalized firing rate for neurons uh, recorded in the look block versus um, the same neurons recorded in the avoid block, and this is the distribution of that activity. Sorry, the different distribution of modulation activity. So in this in this case, the overall before the before the uh, the Q appeared. Um, activity was generally uh, generally higher in the look task compared to the avoid task. Um, uh, and this other example experiment, the activity was identical. Um, and, if, and this shows the um, the, um, the 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 same data for across different experimental sessions in each of the two animals. And you note that um, so you know in some sessions that we. You know, there were, there were clear differences in the pre-Q firing rate among neurons between the two tasks. Uh, 
um, you know, but in other sessions that it was absent. Um, so across all the neurons and all the sessions, um, activity was uh, slightly but significantly higher during the look task versus the avoid task. But that change in activity, as you can sort of see, was quite small and pretty and, 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 and quite variable across the experimental sessions in both the animals. Um, so it wasn't, we weren't too impressed. Um, so we did, so we considered that, well, you know, task school modulation might behave differently than other forms of modulation, you know, um, and so merely comparing the overall mean firing rates might, might obscure more robust effects of uh, task school on the pattern of uh, spiking activity. So we adopted a decoding approach to sort of further examine how robustly task rules, uh, task rule was encoded by the activity of, of uh, the four neurons. So using the same data set, we uh, employed six, six sort of commonly used machine learning algorithms to um, measure the extent to which task rule could be accurately decoded for, uh, during each of the, the, the during, um, sorry, decoded from the neurons recorded during the, the pre-Q period. Um, uh, and the chosen algorithm sort of comprise a sort of broad set of, of complementary approaches based on different decoding principles. I won't go into the details, but they're, they're, you know, it's, a, it's a pretty comprehensive set. So this is, and this is sort of our way of maximizing our confidence in either revealing or ruling out that rule information was uh, available in the activity during the, the, the pre-Q period. All right. So in each experimental session, we measure the accuracy of each decoder in classifying the task rule, look versus avoid, the binary, uh, a binary set of, of um, conditions. Uh, and remarkably, we found that not only could each of the six decoders accurately classify the task well above chance, uh, uh, they could do so in, in every experimental session. So here we're looking at the um, decoder performance for each, sorry, each of the decoders performance across all of the experimental sessions in the two animals. So this is collapsed across all sessions for each decoder. Um, uh, and then here we are looking at the, the performance of each decoder for each experimental day. So this, these are data based on just a single day's recordings across the, the, the uh, experimental sessions. And so you can see that um, for each, regardless of the decoder we used, um, data from, again, I'm, just to remind you, we're, we're, each day there's um, uh, activity from anywhere from as few as 10 neurons to as many as about 25. Uh, and, but that activity was sufficient to uh, accurately classify the, the task rule in the pre-Q period. Uh, and uh, this, this here, by the way, this is, this is not that important, but this, is, uh, this just shows you that the decoder performance didn't depend on whether or not we, we included a, a task irrelevant texture on the, on the display, and that, which was used to just, to get, just to get the neurons to be more active. Uh, and that didn't, that wasn't really necessary. And I won't, so I won't go into detail on that. <clears throat> uh, we also uh, confirmed that the performance of the decoder did not depend on uh, or wasn't related to the animal's performance. So in this case, I'm just showing you the, the performance difference between look and avoid. So it could, you could, it could be that you, you could argue that you might find differences in activity when the animal is performing the look task much better than the avoid task, or the avoid task much better than the look task. So if you just take the sort of app, you know the difference between them and see if it relates to the decoding accuracy, it did not. In fact, um, no matter how you looked at performance, whether it was just the, per the performance on the look task or the avoid task or the average performance on two tasks, it didn't predict the decoding accuracy at all in either uh, animal. Right. So. Um, a number of previous studies found evidence that subpopulations of neurons within visual cortex uh, may be engaged differently during selective attention and working memory. So we also asked if the rule signals we observe at each uh, session might be driven disproportionately by distinct subsets of neurons. And to test that possibility, we took advantage of the, of the feature importance uh, coefficients yielded from the decoding analysis. And these coefficients scale the influence of each of the component neurons uh, in the population of the decoder's uh, performance. And as expected in, uh, in each session, the distributions of feature importance were broad, um, indicating that particular neurons contributed disproportionately to the uh, to encoding task rule. These, dis uh, these distributions show the breadth of the feature importance uh, 
i.e. How, how informative different neurons were uh, decoding uh, across the full population of neurons in the two animals. And so, and note the scale of the axis. So these are pretty broad distributions. All right, so using this information, we, you know, we first sought to de determine the relationship between rule information and the visual responsiveness of V4 neurons. And, so, and, and the reason we did this is that, you know, attentional modulation, which we've worked on quite a bit, tends to co-occur with the largest, with the neurons with the largest visual responses. I mean, you, you, that's, those are neurons that, that, that are more likely to, gen to, to demonstrate clear attentional modulation. So we considered that feature importance might be the, might be largest among neurons exhibiting the largest visual responses. And these visual responses that we're talking about here are responses to the appearance of the cue. So it's a, we're looking at visual activity here and we're, we're, we're comparing it to how much information about the task there was here. All right, so, um, but to our surprise, we found that, op that the opposite um, uh, was true, but opposite, well, what was true was opposite to our expectation. And that was clear in this sort of session by session data uh, in both animals. Um, task rule information or feature importance was negatively correlated with the magnitude of visual responses. Um, and these plots show correlations between the neurons feature information and the, mag the magnitude of its visual response uh, for each recording session and the two monkeys and for each neuron. Um, uh, uh, the, so, right, these are the for individual sessions, each line, and then for each animal, we have the um, the, the correlation coefficients across across um, the population of neurons across sessions uh, for monkey one, monkey two, and then pulled across both animals. So overall, this indicates that neurons conveying the most information about task rules uh, were those with the lowest visually evoked activity, which was pretty surprising to us. In fact, I'm st we're still sort of scratching our head about, the, about that. Uh, right, and so this latter result sort of stood out to us for a number of reasons. And one of those reasons is that it seemed re reminiscent of or perhaps related to a previous set of observations made both in primate and mouse visual cortex. Um, so Ken, Ken Harris and Matera Carandini found that uh, mouse visual cortical neurons vary broadly in the extent to which their activity is coupled to the population firing rate. That is, neurons can exhibit either strong or weak, uh, can, be, can be coupled either strongly or weakly to the, to the population firing rate. And that coupling can be captured in a spike triggered uh, population rate. And this shows the population coupling for four different neurons in mouse visual cortex. And variation in the population coupling is also observed in macaque visual cortex as our data from our lab. Uh, and in addition, uh, using combined data sets from both mouse uh, and monkey visual cortex, uh, it was found that the population coupling strongly predicts the magnitude of, of visually evoked activity. So this is population coupling, this is visually evoked activity, and so you, know, you can predict the, mag the magnitude of visual responses. In addition, uh, in the monkey data, uh, uh, we found that the population coupling also positively correlated with the modulation during top-down attention. So in monkey visual cortex, strongly coupled neurons exhibit the largest responses and the largest attentional modulation. So, um, so we looked at the, uh, the, looked at the same we did the same analysis in the current data, and so and as in the previous study, uh, data in the current study showed population coupling was strongly um, uh, was positively correlated, reliably correlated positively with the magnitude of visually driven activity. And this pattern was observed across experimental uh, um, sessions and in both animals. So uh, strong coupling, strong uh, response magnitude, true in both animals. And uh, um, right. However, we also found that uh, population coupling was negatively correlated with the uh, feature importance, um, a pattern that was observed also also observed across uh, sessions and across uh, monkeys. Thus, the more informative a given neuron's activity was about the task rule in that pre q period, the less um, the neuron was coupled to the population activity. So in addition to uh, observing the, uh, that the most informative neurons were the least visually responsive, we also found that those neurons exhibited the, the weakest, um, um, were, were less likely to be coupled, were less strongly coupled to the population activity. All right, so let me, um, summarize uh, the, 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 that set of results. So um, uh, 
So we found that information about the about abstract rules can be decoded from neural activity uh, within uh, visual cortex, even in the absence of sensory uh, stimulation. Sort of. So even when there's no uh, background stimulus, no relevant or irrelevant, irrelevant stimulation, you can, in, in that pre-Q period, we could decode which rule was enforced. Uh, uh, and in addition, we found that rule information was greatest uh, among neurons with the least visual activity. That was surprising to us. In addition, uh, rule information was greatest among neurons that were, that were the, the, the least, um, that were, were coupled to the population activity than, uh, the least. So um, I just want to add one last point about this uh, to sort of tie us back to the introduction I started with, which is that these rule-related signals in the visual cortex may not generalize to other types of, of rules that we didn't test, right? So we just had this one set of rules in which the animal had to make a particular stimulus response mapping uh, in order to get rewarded. Um, and so, and we're actually pretty sure that they wouldn't generalize to all types of rules, but that's, that's our hypothesis. Uh, instead, we think that sensitivity of visual cortical neurons to rules about how to deploy eye movements likely reflects the specialization of visual cortical areas for integrating visual processing with gaze control. Um, as I mentioned, there are strong inputs from, from, from the frontal eye field, which, input, which um, um, could modulate activity according to the rules that are being uh, in, um, that are enforced. So as I discussed earlier, we know that neurons within primate visual cortex are influenced directly by gaze control neurons in the FEF, right? Um, so it could be that visual cortical neurons signal rules, but only uh, about the rules governing how eye movements are to be uh, planned to different uh, visual stimuli. Okay, so um, I guess I have five minutes. So, I, so in the maybe the last few minutes here, I wanted to switch gears if I, if I could, we can, I can, well, I can you ask what- take time then, it's, uh, it's fine. So, so, so you again? Take, your, take your time, it's fine, we'll, we'll get it here. Yeah, so, but I'm, I might also want to take questions about this part of the talk before, or I can do a question at all at the end, or or I can do them now, because I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, I think maybe currently we don't have any questions in the chat, so maybe we'll just, we'll, we'll... Yeah, okay. Yeah, so let me switch gears a little bit. So, um, so oops, right. So I want to say a little bit about um, uh, some stuff that we're very excited about, which is, we, you know, we've been trying to mobilize these new uh, large-scale uh, 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 large recording tools in macaque monkey. As many of you know, um, the, the, about, many of you know about the recent developments in, 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 in high-density physiology, uh, physiological tools in mice, and you know, the neural pixel tools that were, uh, that were developed you know, a few years ago. Um, uh, so this is just showing you a neural, neural pixel probe. This is a one centimeter shank. There are a thousand channels, thousand recording channels on this shank, um, or nearly a thousand um, of which one, one can record 384 channels actively and you, you can more or less switch almost arbitrarily within them. Um, uh, um, so when these were first deployed in, in the mouse, uh, a number of the non-human primate users organized a sort of consortium to try and get them adapted to, uh, for use in, in monkeys. And I'm gonna tell, and, so, and that's been, I'll tell you a bit about that. But in the interim, we also um, did some, some, some pilot experiments to test them out in, uh, in, in, macaque, in, the, in the macaque visual system. So what you're looking at here actually is a, a set of uh, waveforms that were separate neuronal waveforms that were recorded in, uh, in visual cortex in V1. So each of the waveform corresponds to a neuron. It actually corresponds to the waveform recorded from one of the, con from the contact that, I'm sorry, it's the largest waveform recorded from a given neuron uh, and again, a certain contact and its approximate location on the face of the, um, of the recording electrode. So this is uh, um, this is the depth of the cortex. This is the face of the um, of the probe. So you got about you know 100 or so neurons recorded simultaneously. Um, and so we, uh, as I mentioned, we recently um, began using both the original what I'll call the rodent probes, uh, and also uh, we literally just started using the the, the not even primate probes, which I'll, I'll show you in a second, but. 
Um, I just want to say a bit about the just the incredible um, and sort of uh, and sort of um, the uh, sort of uh, what am I trying to say? The uh, the incredible progress one one can or the to, to, to illustrate how much better uh, the or what you can get from such high density recordings, um, even in areas that we that are well studied, such as Macaque V one. Uh, this is a section through uh, Macaque V one. This and this is showing the the um, recording um, the electro track uh, from a neural pixels probe that was dipped in a dye eye derivative and and recorded across uh, across the layers. The layers are shown kind of dimly there. But because you also have so many channels, you can take the local field potentials and, and create a current source density and identify or estimate the laminar compartments here. So you can see the layer four, see the input layers here. Um, and, um, and just in single recordings in Macaque V1, just an incredible amount of, of, of data that allows one to sort of address or, uh, uh, or um, some uh, important um, unresolved, um, uh, sorry, to, 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 to demonstrate, um, oh, what am I trying to say? <laughs> to to um, um, get an unprecedented number of neurons recorded from single columns of, of, of VV1 and to address certain uh, important issues that are still remaining about the organization and, and circuitry within an area like V1, which has been more, you know, there's been more, more, more studies here than probably any other area in the cortex. So what are we seeing? Are we seeing a hot map of, of you know, each of the 442 waveforms recorded across the depths of the cortex, even including the white matter. So you see the, the sort of negative going part of the waveform first, and then the positive part. So you can see the, the length of the, of the spike waveform and how that distribution varies across the depth. So they're really long. Uh, uh, longer spikes here in layers five, six, and two, three, and smaller within layer four C. And again, we're looking at all the waveforms here. And um, just with that raw, that sort of almost raw data, you can, you can, in one experimental session, discern things such as, well, okay, um, you know, typically when you're recording and you see the, you know, a, a, a spike that has a, a, a peak, initial peak first, you, you might guess that that neuron is, 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 is an axonal spike. Um, but of course, you don't know when you have low numbers. But when the, all of those putative axonal spikes occur in the white matter, it it's, looks pretty clear. Um, you can look at the distribution of the different waveform widths across the, in different uh, compartments. Of course, uh, we 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 temporary and we putatively classify neurons into three different types: um, these putative axonal spikes, the typical fast spiking, regular spiking. But they're clearly more there's more variation across the different laminae. But this but the, the high volume and the high density of recordings from a single column allow you to do this really in, in, in very few experiments. And um, I don't want to say too much about this, but um, let me skip this actually, this takes a bit of time. If I can skip it, it's a lot of data here, but um, it allows you to see things like, you know, sort of in real raw form, you know, orientation columns. These, these, this hot map shows you the orientation tuning curve for for you know, 180 neurons uh, roughly across the layers um, in a single uh, experiment is a responses to a drifting grading that's varying in direction. So you see two peaks here because the, the neuron is orientation tuned, of course, and not really direction tuned. So you see that going through all the layers of cortex, including 4C alpha and beta, and there's been some debate about to, to what extent neurons in layer four and the macaque monkey actually have orientation selectivity, but you can see it clearly here. Um, and of course, you can do things like you can look at take the individual uh, cell populations in different compartments and 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 ask how well you can decode orientation from them. I won't go into much detail here, um, but just to say that that um, this is really incredible uh, uh, what you can do with these. And now uh, we just received the um, um, the non-human primate version. So this is the rodent neural pixels. So, you know, mouse brain is you know it's much smaller, and so you can record throughout the depths of the mouse brain, but this is the primate neuropixels. It's, it's four and a half centimeters long. You know, the macaque monkey brain is some, you know, the monkey brain is some, is roughly this size. And it's got, you know, the same number of channels per, per, per length. 
so incredible number of channels, um, thicker shanks so that you can get through the, 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 the dura of, of, the, uh, of the monkeys. And so, and here we, and so we've been using these for the, uh, for the past month or two, um, and the recording quality is just fantastic. It's just the same as it is in the rodent. This is showing you um, on the right here, you're looking at the sort of the user's view of the activity from the beach of the probe. This is a sort of a mock tip of the probe. Um, it's actually, of course, longer than that, but you, but this voltage um, hot map shows you where there's activity. And so, uh, um, and so you can, See there's a, that, that there's activity across the, the the channels, but you can also select um, individual channels, and, and uh, so in this case we're selecting the tip, the, which is channel zero, and we're looking at up to, to 24 channels beyond it, which is somewhere around here. And you can see here that um, you know the recording quality, the signal to noise is pretty good. And you can, in fact, you can see the waveforms that are recorded across multiple channels because the the uh, each contact is is um, the pitch is, is you know, the spacing is, is very low. And so you, you can get, usually you can get waveforms recorded uh, at between four and seven channels, adjacent channels. So the recording quality is quite good. And so of course that means that and given the length of this means that now we can take our probes and we can uh, record simultaneously from multiple extra stride visual areas. Um, even down deep uh, in, 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 in the cortex, which has never been done before. So we're very excited about these, um, these neural pixels and they'll be available to the broader community uh, probably within the next year or so. But I um, but just wanted to give you a preview of how, how, how incredible they are. All right, let me um, finish up there and say, and Thank my collaborators. Uh, Donatus was uh, uh, one who did the studies on the or led the study on the abstract rule, uh, with, along with Rao Bing and Nir Nassim. Um, I talked earlier about uh, the projection from the front line field that was work done by Mirad Deuce as well as Kelsey Clark, uh, and um, this early the earlier sort of the initial recordings in V1 with neural pixel probes was uh, done with the help of Jonathan Horton from UCSF. Um, let me thank. Um, uh, and then H and Howard Hughes and thank my audience and I'll take some questions now. Great and thanks very much. That was an amazing talk. Super exciting to see um, yeah, to see these recordings again. It's incredible. Um, yeah, so uh, maybe we'll all just uh, unmute ourselves and uh, uh, clap for appearing because it was absolutely amazing, amazing talk. So thanks very much. Hey, um, great. So if anybody has questions, you can either just um, uh, use the raise hand uh, functionality at the chat um, or write the chat if you want me to ask for you. So I can actually start. So I had a question. Um, I was wondering whether you were also looking or plan to look um, at any um, Sorry, at any um, oscillation information. Um, it just it, that your it slightly remind me of of a neuron paper. I mean, this is very different, but uh, from Joni Wallace and Eric Newton, where they also look at the pre um, pre uh, trial period. So 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 before the stimulus is actually on, uh, they're they're doing all this stuff in OFC and hippocampus, but. Uh, they show that um, the disrupt in theta in OFC um, disrupts learning from reward, and it's also like dependent on the on the rules of the task, so which which reward configuration you're actually in. I was wondering, given if I'm correct, that there's also some uh, attentional roles for theta and visual cortex. I was wondering if you're planning also to look at things like that, or if you have any predictions if that will be at all interesting. Yeah, I mean, it would be. So, I mean, I would sort of back up and I would say that if, you know, had we not found what was clearly, what was clearly fairly robust um, kind of rule related signals in the pre Q period in the visual cortex in the spiking activity, if that had not, if we had not seen that, the next place would have been to look at the, the, the LFPs and look at, you know, maybe there's something, because if you're looking at essentially at, at inputs or um, 
and you know activity that may, may not be sufficient to drive spikes, you know, it's just more sensitive. And so if you think that if you know if we were hypothesizing that some of the signals that are that are pretty easy to record and spiking activity up in, in frontal cortex, you know, you know, manages to get back into the visual cortex, but isn't a, isn't sufficient to drive spikes when there's not a visual input, then you know you should you should see them in the um, in the LFPs. But because you, because we don't have to because we see it in the spikes, we don't need to do that. So I would assume that I mean you know it, I, my, my, you know that we would see it in the LFPs, but. Um, I don't know if I have a strong hypothesis about which band, um, you know, maybe beta, beta or, or, but um, but yeah. So we we would expect to, to, to find that. Now, as far as other things like you know, coherence with the spikes. I mean, maybe yeah, maybe spike coherence with beta or uh, maybe gamma. I don't know. But um, we haven't looked at it, so that, that's the that's one short answer. But um, I would expect to find some rule related to be able to de decode the rule um, from the LFPs. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, there's a question from Martin O'Neill. So uh, Martin, you can unmute yourself, maybe. Yeah. Hello, Martin. Can you hear me? Some I, we can't hear for some reason, even though you're unmuted. Okay, can you hear me now? Ah, oh, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Sorry, I had you on a different microphone in my headphones. Hi, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot for yeah, fantastic talk. Um, I was wondering about you know this fascinating result you show about the uh, um with the decreased stimulus response, you see more of this sort of rule related activity. Um, are you watching? And I was wondering, um. You know, we know that stimulus onset reduces the uh, neuronal variability in responses. So I think this is work that, that you've been involved in previously. And I'm wondering if you've thought about this, um, or if you thought about it in this context, is, is it perhaps the, the neural variability um, where the, the activity relating to the rules is contained? That's interesting. Um, I mean, I, but it's the first thing I would say is that if you were to ask me, do I have any insights as to why that relationship exists? I would say virtually none. It's I'm you know we're still confused, uh, kind of confused about I mean why there would be this, why the most informative neurons would be those that, that are the least visual responsive. But but to what ex so so I guess are you asking then if um, if we looked at the change in the variability with the stimulus onset across the different neurons will be fine that there was, I mean, if you control, if you, I mean, for when, you, when you're measuring variability, you know, the, 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 the final factor, for example, you know, um, obviously you have to control for the, for the, for the spike rate, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, are you wondering if the kind of the change in the variability with stimulus onset might be you know, smaller for the most more informative neurons, or just just that the variability might be might be lower for those cells, or it might be might be, or I mean, what's the what, what's what's the prediction? Yeah, I guess so. So the variability might be what where the information relating to the rule is contained, right. which would come out from like a multivariate analysis. And that was the sort of second part of my question. Does your decoding analysis get to that, or would you need to do some additional multivariate analysis? Yeah, probably. Yeah, no, yeah. That's a good. That's a good point. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it, it all comes down to what is it that's unique about those neurons. Um, we did look to see if the kind of feature importance varied by a layer because we're doing you know, laminar recordings and they are pretty much distributed evenly across the different laminae. Um, we haven't done no, other things. We haven't, we haven't looked at the, the the spike waveform types, but you know, but yeah. So one thing we could do yeah, is look at the the variability of the you know cross trial variability of those neurons at any epoch in the task mm -hmm. um, to see if maybe they're they're a different flavor. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, uh, yeah, Juan. Oh yes. Hi. Thank you very yeah. much. It was a great talk. Very interesting. Um, I think I have a couple of boring methodological questions. It's okay. uh, just 
when you showed the decoding, um, I was just curious, because uh, you use this uh, six methods, but I was just wondering uh, which cross-validation procedure uh, was it used? Mm. Or, or were there a variety of cross-validation methods? Uh, I, I, yeah, I mean, oh, wow. So the, <laughs> I, I forget. I mean, this buried in the methods. If the paper's ah, not the right. If it's the, the paper in preprint? No, it, it, it's archived now. Yeah, it's preprint. Ah, okay. yeah. And so, yeah, so our collaborator, Nir Nassim, Nir Nassim is a, you know, he was the expert in machine learning. He's a, actually a, not even a neuroscientist. He's a, a, a his lab, uh, anyway, he, he, um, he develops novel machine learning techniques, and so for him, these were the sort of standard techniques. But so yeah, all the details are in the in the um, in the methods there. But I forget what the you know. And I think um, just my quickly follow up question on that was that uh, towards the very end, you showed one slide that had like a plot with population decoding performance and sort of like unit decoding. Um, and I was just wondering if if yeah, so so at the very very end when you were talking about the the neuro neuro pixels, yeah, yes. Uh, I was just wondering when you did the decoding for the abstract rules, was that done um, taking into account the population activity, or was that done? Uh, you, you were you uh, measuring the decoding uh, like per isolated unit? So in the rule, it, it's all. Oops, sorry, it's all. That's all done on the simultaneously recorded population for that session. So. If there are 12 cell, 12 units, then we did the, on those 12 units. It's all, it's, you know, so it's you combine the activity of all, of all 12 yeah, units. In, okay. It's the real, real population, real simultaneous population, not pseudo populations. In this slide I'm showing here from V1, this is we're decoding, we're using a binary decoder to decode the orientation, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's, whether, we're, whether we're, we're comparing the responses to the preferred orientation mm -hmm. to any of a set of orientations that differ from that. Uh, it's a binary um, decoder. Um, and that's done on the on a po on simultaneous populations across different laminae. So if you just you know if it's eight, fifteen you know or sorry these are, these are ten cell populations, mm -hmm. ten ten neuron populations. So you take ten ten random neurons in layer four C and you do the decoding across the different orientation differences. Uh, you take neurons in four B or two three, et cetera, et cetera. And this is a so that's a population decoder. Mm -hmm. um, you can you can do that, um, and you can also you you can you can shuffle the trials also to get rid of the correlations. Um, that doesn't really change things. And in fact, if you do just single neuron decoders, so you take, yeah, um, you get the, so this was just, a, this by the way, is just showing that the input layer, uh, layer 4C, you know, performs at least as well, if not better than superficial and deep layers, which is kind of a surprise. Um, and that's whether you use a population decoder or a single neuron decoder. And this is just showing you that that's because the 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 response reliability, the variation across me, trials in response to the, to the, the given neuron is lower in the input layers and than the other layers. But yeah, so this is right, and this decoder was a, just a, a linear classifier. I forgot which. Yeah, the, there's so many algorithms these days. I, I lose track of the details, but that's all. This is also archived, by the way. Um, and so you can, so the details are there. Um, and then the, the, so before the, I can go back here. Um, it's not letting me go back because this, this is a really big slide that I skipped here. And so it's, it's slow. Um, um, oops, I'm gonna keep going. Yeah, that's, that's archived. Um, so it's, it's in there, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Mark. Hi. Yeah, I don't know if you can probably can't see me, but maybe that doesn't matter. Um, I, I just see a bridge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm not sure how to show my face. Um, but so yeah, great, great talk, Professor. I really, really enjoyed it. And it's fabulous that you've shown um, these abstract rules being represented in in visual areas like like V4. And I mean, as you know, and as you said. In some of your earlier slides, people like Wallace and Miller have found abstract rules encoded throughout prefrontal cortex, and people like Mansouri and, and Tanaka and colleagues too. So I'm wondering, really, do you think there's anywhere that rules are not represented in cortex? But with you know special regard to visual cortex, what would be your predictions for other visual areas? And do you think that rules might actually be re represented as early as V1, say? And do you think it might be something to do with you know the particular connections between frontal areas, these regions. What would be your speculation for other other visual areas? 
Yeah. So the first thing I would emphasize is that I don't. I really my my strong sort of strong hypothesis would be that if the if we were first to ask the question, um, does kind of this affect uh, or sorry, does the does the decoding of rules in this particular case in the four um, is that general? In other words, if we change the, the rules and we have the animal do a, say a lever release or some other behavioral response mapping, um, would we still be able to code the rules? I, my guess would be no, or it'd be much much weaker. But but I think I think that because we, the task involved between these two different Zoom and, and Keynote don't really cooperate very well. All right, um, if we went between if we change this to a, a response to something other than an eye movement, um, that we that that would probably diminish the um, the, the, the 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 rule information in this task, and so um, uh, that's that's one one strong hypothesis, you know, because again, visual cortex gets this you know organized direct projections from from gaze control areas and, and prefrontal cortex from the FDF, um, and uh, and to a lesser extent, other behavioral responses, or, or you know, if the, other, if the responses are not spatial. This is a spatial response, right? The response was just like a yes, no, lever release, or some other kind of button press. I wouldn't expect to find it. Um, now, to your question about V1, I, I would, yeah, because anytime you find, if, if you have this effect that's that clear in V4, it's probably going to get find its way back to V1. It's only one synapse away, right? And so I, I would, I would expect to decode this particular task uh, in V1, if not by, with this, and from the spikes, then from the LFBs. Um, but if the rule were different and didn't involve a, a psychotic response, I would different, something different. And we, yeah, and we should test that. Thank you. Oh, you, although you can't see it, I'm nodding in agreement. Thank you. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, uh, Oliver and Jan? Hello, oh, uh, fascinating stuff. Um, I mean, you've shown this information is getting back into V4 or to a subset of, pop of cells in V4. And I wonder what it's good for there, given that those are the cells that apparently are least visually responsive. So, I mean, do you think that that information is getting transmitted within V4 to the other cells, but isn't apparent in, at the time of the, in, in, the, in the interval? Or do you think that these cells despite being visually relatively unresponsive, are in fact contributing um, to, to, to the behavior by doing their special status? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I guess, I, I mean, there's two, yeah, there's, there's kind of two ways of looking at this. And the first way is kind of like, you know, kind of the more, I don't know, visceral, not visceral, but sort of the, the reflex as a, as a, as a a physiologist working in primates, which is that, you know, very often you find correlates of an activity that cor correlates with the behavior, but it doesn't mean that that activity, of course, is, is being used for behavior. And if you do like an inactivation or you get rid of the, the activity, then the animal, there's no deficit, right? That happens a lot. Um, and so, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we were to eliminate this signal if, uh, that it had no impact on the behavior. It's, you know, um, it, it's probably, present throughout extra stride visual cortex, so it's all over the place. Um, so I, I wouldn't expect it to be necessary for the task. But now that doesn't mean it's, it's um, that we can't ask the deeper question you asked, which is what is it there for? Um, that's not the same question, right? So um, that's, yeah, that's hard to, to, to answer. So I, well, let, me, let me elaborate some on this though. Um, so the reason why we did this experiment in the first place was that you know, there's that okay, obviously in PFC and parietal cortex, you know, you're going to find, you know, as I alluded to earlier in the talk, you know, you're going to get neurons that respond that encode the 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 remembered location in the delay period, right? We all know that, right? Well, and you you can get you can find that in visual cortex as well. It's not very strong, but areas like B4, we'll, we'll, you'll have you'll you'll find neurons that even in the absence of visual uh, visual visual uh, stimuli, there'll be some delay activity that, that you can read out and, and know where the cue used to be. It's not again, it's not very strong. Um, and before, it's you know it's weaker yet than V two and almost absent in V one. 
And we, we, what we wanted to know if that activity had more to do with sort of the, the kind of spatial working memory per se, or movement planning, right? So, because in this task, you can solve the, the problem by just, just, just by, by, by memorizing where, where your eye has to go, right? So when the, the cue comes on here, you can plan the movement during the delay and then make it later on, right? In this task, you can't do that. You have to remember the location of the stimulus and, you know, just, and then make the eye move. You can't plan this movement or this movement or that movement because you have no idea where these are going to be later on. It can be, it can be here and over here or here, or over there, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, what, I, what I'm not telling you, about, I'm, so I'm only reporting on the data we recorded here. I'm not telling you about what we found here. What we found in this, in here and during these two tasks is that there's delay activity here and no delay activity here. And that sort of fits with our kind of working model of what's of what these this modulation is coming from. This modulation is coming from, in part, from the frontal eye field, which of course knows a lot about where the eyes, the, the, the eye, um, knows a lot about the planned eye movements. And so, and um, what I'll, uh, another thing that we found very, very recently, like in the past week, is that if you inactivate the frontal eye field and look for performance of these two tasks, you impair this one, but you don't impair this one. So the delay activity, even in the frontal eye field, seems to encode the planned movement, not really the sort of abstract spatial working memory. And so these neurons, so we think the extrastriatal cortex is getting input from, you know, so the frontal eye field is kind of the bottleneck, you know, in the mechanic visual system it, uh, with, with respect to visual cortex. It's, you know, the, the input to visual cortex from prefrontal cortex goes pretty, pretty much through the FEF. I mean, you can, there are projections down to TE from 46 and these other ventral areas, but for the most part, the input is, is directly from the frontal eye field. The frontal eye field is, is you know, the representation are not as abstract as, as they are in say 46. It really is gaze related. And so there is just this channel of, uh, of information about, about eye movement plans that get into uh, uh, extra stride visual cortex. And so when you have a rule that has, to, that, has to, that concerns where the eye is gonna go, that's why, you, that's why we see modulation in, in visual cortex. You know, it, it, um, it's kind of a non-natural task. So you know, maybe the fact that you find this is is not. So it's maybe the question of you know what 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 is it there for in that task is not really a great question because it's kind of an artificial task anyway. Um, but it's but it, it got there because information about where the eye is going to go is directly related to uh, visual cortex. <laughs> if I just put a rider on that, I mean. You've, you've got good reasons for looking at it in the in the interval where the response is not going to get confused by what the eyes are actually doing. But is it possible that the that you have you happen to have hit a set of neurons that are particularly active during intervals, and that actually there are effects on the other neurons, but they only show up uh, when the cue has arrived, or they only become visible in spikes when the cue has arrived? Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, I absolutely. Yeah. That. That. That kind of sets up sets up all kind of interest all kinds of interesting hypotheses about what we might find, oof, what we might find oof, past all this. I should just gone through uh, what we might find. Um, you know, out here we, we haven't actually I haven't talked about what those you know the most informative neurons are doing out in these epochs, right? And, and in fact, we haven't really looked at, you know, there's yeah, a lot of interesting things, but yeah, but I, I agree with that. And yeah, um, it'd be nice to work out exactly, exactly what those hypotheses might be. Um, because yeah, because here you have all these, you have this, you know, visual signals that are spatial, you got delay activity, and then you've got, you know, um, the movement. So one could imagine making predictions about how that rule signal might, inter might guide those, that guide that behavior out here. Yeah. In fact, no, we, we, well, we did look, actually, I, I don't remember, we haven't finished it, so I don't want to say anything wrong. So um, <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> thanks a lot. That's a good question. Okay, thanks, Ove. Yeah, so any more questions? Um, otherwise, yeah, I think we're actually quite uh, over time. So thanks again, Taryn, for an excellent talk. It was super interesting. Thank and thanks, everybody, for joining. Okay.
Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Have a nice evening. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> I can actually start your day now. <laughs> All right. Ciao. All right.